Hey guys, it's Standing for Truth coming to you live tonight. Um, I've got a guest with me. Um, his YouTube channel name is Snake Was Right. Um, we're gonna have just a little uh, a little dialogue here on creation evolution. Um, should be fun. I appreciate um, uh, Taylor. I'm I'm gonna refer to him ha as um, for joining me in this dis uh, discussion tonight, as well as I've got Landon here, who's going to um, just moderate for us, make sure that the uh, discussion is is flowing nicely and just making sure that it's um, it's going well. Um, so I want to introduce um, Taylor. If you wanted to say a few things, uh, brother, go ahead. Floor is yours. Howdy. Uh, I'm uh, my channel name is snake was right. And uh, I'm an atheist. Uh, I'll mention that I, I went to a Catholic school for four years uh, just for that background. Um, that's pretty much where I became an atheist. Um, and the channel name, just to explain that, uh, Snake Was Right uh, just means uh, I think that the knowledge of good and evil is a good thing to have. So that's my intro. Awesome. Um, well, I appreciate that. Uh, Landon, you'll be moderating for us. Um, we're going to go, uh, so structure wise, you know, it's just going to be free flowing dialogue, you know, little, okay. little interruptions. Uh, Landon's going to be moderating, making sure everything goes well. After the hour mark, um, it can become a free for all at, at that point. If people just want to talk about random things or whatever for another 45 minutes or, or an hour, uh, should be cool with me. Um, thanks for moderating for us, Landon. Oh yeah, no problem. It's it's good to be here. So awesome. Thanks, brother. I appreciate it. Um, so I guess my question would be just to kind of start it off, Taylor, um, because I'm sure we'll be throwing around the word um evolution quite a bit during this um discussion. But at the end of the day, I think the the term evolution can mean uh, many different things, right? In in general, it just means change over time. I would yeah. say, you know, biological evolution would mean a change in, say, allele frequency or, or gene pool in populations over time or generations. Like, what would your definition uh, be? Uh, I think that's a fair definition for biological evolution. Um, okay. I, th um, I, I think for me, in regards to say the model that I hold to uh, like a biblical based model, you know, I'm not opposed to change. I'm not opposed to, you know, a change in allele frequency or, or gene pool, of course, but that type of, uh, you know, micro evolutionary variation, Taylor, you know, where you get a change in um, say the frequency of, of the expression of, of different traits. I don't think that's really disputed among you know creationists or evolutionists mm -hmm. uh, i just think that explains you know the small scale variation but not the major innovations uh, you know the major origin events of say major new forms of life um do you think that that allele frequency change in allele frequency um would explain say you know quote unquote the arrival of the fittest go ahead yeah that's what the point of the theory of evolution is is to explain the biodiversity and um, that's what Charles Darwin's book was, The Origin of Species, Speciation. Um, and so, yes, I do think that there is sufficient evidence to say that uh, the mechanisms of evolution, whether they be just mutation or just uh, changing allele frequencies that already exist, um, or, you know, dialing up the tallness or shortness, you know, of whatever trait I that does we do have evidence of that creating uh, speciation um, so would you say uh, just based on what you said on, on the mechanisms would you say that y you know you believe in um, an unguided process of, of natural selection um, acting upon random variation or, or random mutation like would that be the basic uh, mechanism behind um, that type of large scale evolution? Well, it's not unguided. There are evolutionary forces acting on the populations at all times and maintaining the allele frequencies or getting rid of uh, unbeneficial ones and conserving the beneficial ones. Right. So I guess it would be my position that, um, say, if we're looking at mutations, you know, I, I would say that mutations are. 
uh, more so destruction and, and, and not construction. I would say that these mechanisms, you know, neo-Darwinism, I would say that it lacks, you know, incredible explanatory power in regards to, um, you know, the origin of phenotypic complexity, anatomical novelty, um, and also, you know, the origin of non-gradual modes of transition, say abrupt um, fossil appearance. I think in short, I just think mutations and natural selection, you know, natural selection is a fine tuning process and you can certainly get variation based on mutations, but I would say that they lack um, significant creative powers. Like what would you um, say to my uh, point on that? So I had to listen back on my debate with Nephilim a couple of times to understand really what he was trying to say. Uh, he kept asking me, how does the the beneficial effects of a mutation outweigh or uh, overcome, is what he said, overcome the deleterious effects. And uh, so it, it took me a couple of times to actually understand because uh, I, I think what he was actually trying to ask is that well, I think what he was assuming in his question is that each mutation, no matter if it's beneficial or not, that it necessarily comes with deleterious effects. Um, and I was just trying to explain that while most mutations are harmful, there are some individual ones that are not. And those individual ones might, they could carry a trade-off, but sometimes they don't. Um, and it's not like you carry with you all of the bad mutations. And I think that's what Nephilim was assuming there, um, because you can just get a single beneficial protein out of a mutation, and you don't necessarily have to get bad mutations. It's just a numbers game. No, I, I appreciate the response. I think just to clarify, would you say that um, you know mutations that are um, beneficial and have no ultimate deleterious effect, would you say that they would be rare more so? Very rare. Okay, so I think so. If I if I look at my starting point, um, say in regards to a biblical model and the fall, so we would predict death, decay. So obviously, uh, judging by the first few minutes of of our back and forth here, we don't disagree on mutations. We don't disagree on natural selection. But I think the bottom line would be that you know selection would remove, and I think you agree with this based on listening to what you said. You know, selection is going to remove the worst deleterious mutations, the worst detrimental mutations, and it's going to amplify only the best rare beneficial mutations. But um, my point would be that this means that, say, the accumulating damage based on these, you know, low impact deleterious mutations, the one that natural selection, um, the, 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 the low impact mutations that are um, invisible to natural selection, that accumulating damage is largely invisible. Um, and, and to make it simple for the audience, kind of like rust on a car, because if you think of it this way, um, Taylor, you know, we've got a genome of, say, three billion letters. And if you take out one letter, change one letter randomly, say, are you going to have a huge fitness effect? Obviously not. You know, it's going to have a tiny fitness effect. And well, it could fact, knock out the whole system. Well, I, I would say it's kind of like rust on a car. You know, you can't see each rust event, but it's continuous and destructive. So. If you what get do rust you do on with the right part, the whole thing won't work anymore. But you could get rust on somewhere where it doesn't even matter. Well, the thing is, if you're looking at um, the, the genome as a whole and just say, you know, one random mutation that might not have an obvious, you know, phenotypic effect on the mm -hmm. actual genetic content, you know, it's going to be slightly deleterious, kind of like that individual rust spot on the car. So let's say the accumulating damage is largely invisible, like I was saying, but these adaptations, obviously I'm not disagreeing with those, say antibiotic resistance, melanoprotein example, like whatever it is, those will be highly visible, but that means you're going to have to present me with, you know, say a thousand examples of adaptation through whether it's beneficial duplication, point mutation, just to well, address the key. I think the key issue, Taylor, is net gain versus net loss. Yeah, I right. think I see the problem here. Um, and I, I do want to point out that uh, mutations are very frequent in bacteria and viruses. Right. And we can see them evolving rather quickly. Um, but your point about the genome accumulating damage is uh, 
it it actually is able to edit out things that it doesn't need or that are damaging it. And there's just like as many ways as it can acquire beneficial traits, there are a, like at least dozens of different ways that the organism can get rid of bad traits. Um, so, for example... Yep, yeah, go ahead. Um, well, the genome is constantly degrading in a way. I agree. It's, it's always... Uh, at a uh, victim of entropy, but the gene, the good genes will spread. So the genes that don't get used, that have no pressures on them, will pretty much just get forgotten in the shamble, in the shamble. And the good genes will keep getting used and keep getting spread. And the the de deleterious mutations or genes will just sometimes they'll just disappear due to mutations. There are, there are gene deletions that are mutations as well. And uh, so there's just so many ways that the genome naturally loses this information, but it will conserve the, the good information. And one of those ways is breeding. That's one of the great way, the great things about um, uh, sexual reproduction is because you, you might have a good gene and a bad gene and your partner might not have either one, and you have 50-50 chance of passing on, you might only pass on your good gene, or you might only pass on your bad gene. But if you pass on the good gene, then that's gonna conserve in your child, and your child might not inherit your bad gene. And that's how, through breeding, through, uh, yeah, that is a selection process of just reproducing. Um, well, okay. The, I've got, the bad stuff just naturally falls away. Yeah, I, I would say natural selection is just a fancy way of saying, you know, differential reproduction. You know, who's reproducing the most? But I wrote a few a few things down on on what you said here. So, uh, for example, uh, you said beneficial mutations are rare, and the genome is constantly uh, degrading, and and we see entropic degeneration on, on a genomic level. So I, I agree with that. Uh, but I think it's pretty obvious that due to the rarity of, 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 say, beneficial mutations that are actually not deleterious to some extent, those beneficial mutations are not going to compensate for, um, as I said, I, I think it comes down to a net loss versus a net gain of information. Those beneficial mutations are not going to compensate for uh, the net loss of, of information. And natural selection, because you talked about um, traits, you know, natural selection it's it's a fine tuning mechanism you know it, it keeps the the species as good as it can be so i don't disagree with that so we do agree on that but it's severely right. constrained by you know what's called selection interference and, and just to go into that a little bit you know selecting for one trait as you talked about interferes with selecting for another trait and when you have billions of traits taylor you know segregating in in the population then the selection process actually starts to work against itself and what that means at the end of the day is that you end up uh, with being able to only select the best and worst mutations as, as I talked about earlier. So I think evolutionists, I think you're guilty of this right now, they assume based on universal common ancestry, right, it's gotta be true type thing. So they're assuming that these mutations, they're gonna have a net neutral effect, but we know that's wrong based on uh, this selection um, interference. And, and I think just to put it, in a nutshell and on everything that you said there and i wrote down the problem is that you know we know that beneficial mutations are very rare which we agree on so that's good and non-neutral mutations are consistently deleterious as we should actually expect um you know with typographical errors in a in attack so i think increasing fitness is going to be very difficult uh and, and very much problematic. And you talked about, you know, beneficial mutations, say in bacteria, uh, or just beneficial mutations in, in general. The problem that I have though, Taylor, is that, you know, the best beneficial mutations, they're mostly reductive. Let's, let's take sickle cell anemia, for example. It's got a significant impact. You know, I heard you talk about, you know, that with meth, and I agree with everything you said, but what it is, it's a broken gene, broken protein, 
And in the long run, it's it's not really taking things forward and it's not really addressing the issue of neck broken pain. Is relative. Loss. There's nothing broken in the chemistry. You can't break chemistry. It's only, it doesn't understand what it's doing. It just does what it does. So uh, when you have sickle cell, it's not, it just doesn't work the way that you want it to maybe for uh, oxygenation, but it has other beneficial effects. So you're um, saying it's, okay, so you're saying it's deleterious in one way, but it's beneficial in another, but I'm saying it comes down to a net loss versus a net gain. So how are you going to compensate for the information loss based on, you know, a couple rare beneficial mutations? Because if, if you're throwing out a ton of information, you know, and, and, and you're seeing erosion of um, information, erosion of, of nucleotides, how are you going to compensate for the actual information loss? Because a couple of rare beneficials are not going to um, counterbalance the accumulating damage. So with me, under the assumption of death, decay, degeneration, that's consistent. But to take your fish to fishermen or your, or your bacteria to biologist and, and build a genome, I don't know how you're going to build a genome by um, degrading information. And, and you talked about bacteria. I just want to touch on that real quick, see what you think. You can just Google, you know, bacteria, reductive evolution, and it's very, it, it's a common place. There's tons of papers that, you know, they're subject to uh, reductive evolution. Like if you take Lenski, for example, there were beneficial mutations. Uh, there were adaptations seen. So I'm going to agree with you on that. But they were largely accomplished, Taylor, through loss of function, loss of promoter, loss of genes. So his, his own data, Lenski, for example, he's revealing clear evidence of genetic degeneration. And that's not really going to take your fish to fishermen. It's not going to take your evolution forward because it's, it's a net loss of information. So my question would be for you. I'm really curious. How do you deal with the net loss versus the net gain? Go ahead. All right. Well, um, I'm going to need a couple minutes. Um, well, you mentioned uh, loss of information being a benef uh, being a mutation and that ca loss can actually be a gain so we have a bunch of dna or we don't have a bunch of dna that are that the apes do and that's a major that's one of the major differences between us and them is we deleted some regulatory mechanisms so you can actually you're not you can actually have that is a way of getting rid of uh, bad uh, dna we deleted a bunch of DNA and uh, got smarter as the result. So, well, like, is, um, is, is I just just real, I just want to clarify just to follow what you're saying. Is this more um, hypothesizing, theoretical? Because you're looking at both the genomes and, and comparing, or is this something that you've actually observed and seen, say, in the lab? Uh, well, when you compare the two genomes, there are. Right. There are similarities, and there are genes that we don't have that uh, apes do have. So if you yeah. put that DNA, if you yeah. took the ape DNA and you took out uh, those sections of DNA, uh, I could send you the paper uh, if you need that, but um, you would probably get a human. We can't clone humans, so we can't actually test that. So but that we would so have a theoretical genome. Well, you would be working with a human genome at that point. You could no, just I, heard that. I get what you're saying, but you're not really like, let, let, let's say observable right now, you know, based on what we know about natural selection, based on what we know about, you know, mutation accumulation, because it's, it's largely recognized that we accumulate, you know, 100 to 300 new mutations per person per generation. That's 7 billion mutations this generation, given the but all those, that we know. All those fine-tuning processes and mechanisms, they work against deleterious mutations and even useless DNA. We but just lose we lose stuff naturally. If it if you don't use it, you lose it, basically, is what's going on here. No, it's because these these low impact mutations, as I was talking about earlier, they build up relentlessly because these deleterious mutations, Taylor, they're pouring in and they delete themselves. They, they can sometimes. be removed. Right? And they don't get passed on as no, frequently no. as beneficial mutations. No, 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 they do because the, most mutations are, are not neutral. They're nearly neutral. They build up in the population in the genome. Natural, they're they're um, invisible to natural selection. So 
how are you going to, if we inherit a multitude of old, old mutations? Because if you don't use it, you lose it. If, well, if no, there's no selection, pre positive selection pressure, then it's likely it's just randomly going to go away one day. And that happens. Well, it, those, here's, are, those here's, are gene deletion mutations. Here, here's the problem because, and, and I think you agree with this, you, you, all the papers say it, you know, human mutation rate is 100 mutations per person per generation. That means, Taylor, that our children have about 100 mutations more than we have. And our grandchildren are going to have 100 more mutations than they have. So on a population level, like I said, that's 700 billion new mutations entering the human population this generation. So the question I'm asking you is what type of selection could eliminate so many mutations that are pouring into the, the, the human population? Because they are passed on. And if they're at neutral, near neutral nucleotide sites, they erode information, but selection does nothing ab about it because selection acts on the phenotype, not the genotype. It's either, you know, That's the organism as a whole or not at all. Correct? Uh, no, because we actually split our genotypes when we reproduce. Correct. Correct. But those those mutations, the ones that we're inheriting from our parents, 100 to 300, those are um coming in to the next generation. And if they're near neutral, selection can't do anything about them. Because I said at the beginning that selection will amplify the best beneficial mutations and get rid of the worst deleterious mutations. But it's those low impact neutral mutations like rust on a car or typographical error in say a book the size of an encyclopedia. Those are the ones that build up and erode our information systems over time. And there's no way natural selection can get rid of those. I mean, what, what, how well, do you is. Natural selection can get rid of any gene. Uh, if so if they're near neutral, that it's not really doing anything. There's no selection pressure toward it other than just pure entropy. Um, so exactly. if, if exactly. it becomes a problem for the organism, then there is a major selection pressure and it will get selected out. No, because or, the, or the organism will go extinct, which most organisms have. It's that, rare, it's that rare one that ekes by that will continue on the line. See, and it's because populations have bloomed and shrunk and almost all of uh, humanity was almost dead at a certain point and we're back. See, it's, it's because these mutations at these near neutral nucleotide positions, Taylor, you know, they're deleterious and subject to random drift, which makes them immune to um, selection. But these nucleotide, because you're saying, you know, it's not going to do anything because it's near neutral, but those nucleotide sites, they contain meaningful information and in, in the mutation contributes to the erosion of that information. So collectively, since, you know, we agreed that, you know, beneficial mutations are rare, obviously the uh, near neutral nucleotides are going to account for, for most of the information in the genome. So uh, just to, to make the audience understand it more, to put it into an analogy, you know, this would be as true as the fact that, you know, all the seemingly insignificant letters in a book collectively add up to a clear message, Taylor. If we start to introduce typographical error, say, most of the individual errors, you know, they're only gonna have an extremely trivial effect on the total message. So individually, I agree, they're, they're truly insignificant, as you said, but here's the issue. It's that if this process is not halted, the message will eventually become corrupted and will eventually be completely lost. And that's what we're seeing in our genomes because natural selection can't do anything about these near neutral, low impact deleterious mutations. So once again, how do you explain the net loss versus the net gain if you're gonna take your you know, fish to fishermen? Go ahead. Well, uh, since you haven't observed any of that, that's a much bigger leap than any amount of uh, changes proposed by macroevolution. Um, well, we are you see, saying we haven't seen anything die just because it's so genetically corrupt? Um, we can we can do can that by breeding like dogs, um, but they're still pretty much healthy. And if you start breeding them with other dogs, those deleterious uh, effects will start going away because they're mixing with healthy dogs. The thing is, if if you look at a lot of this dog breeding, let's just say you know like a wolf to a chihuahua, for example. You know, for the most part, that's um, you know, that's the degradation of information. If you take all the chihuahuas and throw them back into, um, into the wild, obviously they're going to last one day. It's not degradation. Well, you, you're losing a lot of information. Like the allelic variety, 
and the allelic potential in say something like a chihuahua versus something like a wolf? Obviously we can agree that. No, it, 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 they're essentially the same species. They can interbreed. Oh, I agree that that they can interbreed, but the allelic potential and the allelic variability in something like a wolf. I mean, I've talked to dog breeders, and you know they can take two generic dogs and and probably breed almost anything. But if you take two Chihuahuas, well, there's there's not enough allelic potential there to breed really in, in anything else because the information has has been lost. But um, I want to back up what I said about Chihuahua out of chihuahuas you could just because there are chihuahua mixes you could just keep mixing that whatever has chihuahua in it with a with a dog of another breed and generations down the line you will have no chihuahua well it, it, obviously we're talking about artificial selection here but it's still not explaining you know the Same net mechanisms because there's, there's two models here right like i'm predicting death decay degeneration and that's exactly what we see but you know to go from your single cell multi-cell fish amphibian reptile mammal oh. you know monkey bird whatever it is you know that's going to take massive increases in in genetic information and if there's a net loss versus a net gain and what we see is a net loss of, of, of genetic information based on the accumulating damage of near neutral low impact mutations that pretty much falsifies that type of you know pawns come to people evolution and i got a ton of exam because because you talked about extinction taylor and mm -hmm. i've got a paper right here that talks about mammoth populations so paleogenomic evidence uh, it's in the journals but i can send it to you but these mammoth populations were highly um, had a high genetic load, elevated genetic load, which which led to their extinction. And even Neanderthals, they were um, highly inbred and had a, a very high genetic load. And, and the paper talks about how they were 40% less fit than modern humans based on accumulating um, genetic yeah, damage. Yeah. Exactly. So all we see is death, degeneration, so they don't get to pass on their shitty genes. But the thing is, they're dying due to accumulation of near neutral mutations. And a lot of them are dying because they're highly inbred. So they're subgroups, they're mini populations. So what that is, it's a sneak preview as to where we're going based on this accumulating genetic mistakes. Because we know if it's if it's a small, you know, inbreeding population, well, they're gonna decay and, and go extinct sooner. But the point is it's inevitable. And natural selection can't act on these low impact deleterious mutations. So, you know, once again, how do you explain this? um net loss versus neck are you familiar with the hobbits homo floriensis yeah so you you've already demonstrated how natural selection <laughs> takes care of this because there are other uh animal lineages living on past all these other animals that have supposedly died of genetic corruption but this is how natural selection works 99 percent die and the one percent goes on but the thing is the 1%, as I said, if, if we're accumulating 100 to 300 new mutations per person, per individual, we're carrying along those near neutral uh, mutations. So we're only declining with age because there's a pandemic. You can probably even agree with me, Taylor. There's entropic degeneration on all levels. Just look around, you know, Alzheimer's, dementia, autism, asthma, autoimmune disease, cancers, immunological related disease. I mean, it's just, mutation related negative effects everywhere. So I don't see how that's consistent with your- well, uh, how, you know, are, how, how are these diseases mutating to be more fit? Well, they're yeah. not mutating to be more fit because the accumulating yeah. genetic load is what's revealing these. Cause for example- they're let's take, better at killing us, some of them. I'm sorry, go ahead, uh, repeat that. Some of these diseases are getting better at killing us. We can barely keep up with the flu. We now have MRSA, uh, which is, uh, um it's That's resistant, it's resistant to to talk as well. yeah i agree but the thing is disease death decay degeneration mutation that's not going to uh, that's more consistent with with the biblical base model and even even Lenski's own experiment with the back so we see it in you know in bacterial populations and you but mentioned a problem for genetics anyway that may be the case but there's no, there's no there's no papers that I'm aware of that puts a, any kind of clock on it because these these hundred mutations per generation is, if they're near neutral, they're just not going to impact the organism at all. So it doesn't matter. As well, soon as they become 
uh, subject to selection pressures by being beneficial or not. Well, I, I've got a I've got a paper as well, and it what it shows is that um, even if a substantial fraction Taylor of the human genome is functional, say is not junk DNA then the evolution of man would not even be possible based on this genetic degeneration. And uh, cause I know a lot of the evolutionists like to fight and I'm sure we can get into that. They like to fight, um, you know, ENCODE and, and how they revealed that, you know, over 80% of our, our uh, genome is transcribed into RNA. But even if I just gave you, um, if, if I just said, Hey, listen, for sake of argument, most of the genome is, is junk in this paper. Um, it demonstrates that human evolution, would still be impossible even if the genome was only 10% um, functional. And like I said, ENCODE has obviously revealed that over 80% of it is transcribed in RNA suggesting function. So once again, I mean, this type of evolution seems to be falsified, impossible, and more consistent with like a biblical based model of death, decay, degeneration. Go ahead. Um, could you cite that? Uh paper yeah it's um here I'll, I'll i'll put it to the side so are you i'm gonna put are you familiar with i'm gonna put it in the side chat brother but i wanted to ask you uh are you from as you look at that are you familiar with um uh, well you mentioned viruses okay so I've, I've shown you, you know, bacterial examples. I've shown you mammoth populations, homo, you know, Neanderthal, hobbits, for example, you know, um, entropic degeneration on all levels in regards to diseases, but even the H1N1 human version, and I got a paper here too, if you wanted to see it, it's, uh, it's, it's widely accepted, and you might be aware of this, that it, it went from, and this is the human version. They've got swine flu versions um, circulating right now. But the, that's besides the point, the human version, Taylor, it went from a red hot pandemic to a whimper to an extinction event in 90 years. And uh, what was observed here in, in the study was a linear uh, accumulation of mutations. So this is also genetic entropy um, at work. And, and evolutionists themselves, they cannot explain why the H1N1 virus is extinct in, in humans because adaptive evolution obviously doesn't cause um, extinction and, and the paper it's, goes on it's not even a human virus <laughs> so you witnessed an attempt to evolve and it failed yeah this virus went it, from it attempted to adapt to a new environment sort of it worked and then it couldn't go any further well, what was seen was that there was a decline in functionality, which was predicted um, based on what we know about low yeah, impact. Yeah, it's not fit for human infection. So are, are you familiar with, with what I'm talking about in regards to the H1N1 human version that went? Um, because it was a red hot pandemic at first. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. I mean, it killed how many, how many well, millions of people? But in 90 this, years. All of this is consistent with evolutionary theory. I don't understand how, you know, death, degeneration, mutation, accumulation, uh, say bacteria getting rid of genes, short-term but long-term degeneration. I don't understand how that's gonna, because for example, you talked about um, gene duplications a lot and, and we can get into that, but even gene duplications, Taylor, you know, those are almost, and, 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 and tell me if you disagree with that, but, um, Gene duplications are almost universally deleterious. So even if I gave you, for sake of argument, just to not go on about it for an hour or two hours, if I just gave you a few rare beneficial duplications, they're still not going to be able to offset the many accumulating deleterious mutations, let alone all the other accumulating mutations that are not duplicated related. So, I mean, how do you explain the net loss versus the net gain? Because I'm not being convinced of, of that type of large scale evolution based on uh, degeneration and decay of a genome. I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me. Can you make me understand it? It's just a numbers game. You ask enough girls out, one of them will say yes. Uh, <laughs> My wife said the yes. same thing. Uh, you said gene duplication is universally is almost universally deleterious, and that's right. just not true because you can have extras of one gene that's just a, basically a backup sometimes it's it's a problem especially when you're when the gene uh relies on a mount 
and you can get too much of a thing being transcribed, but that's not always the case, um, especially with sex chromosomes. Um, do you it, have like, because because I noticed you said numbers games. Like, if you were to put some numbers on it, like, are you familiar with? Um, well, you're probably familiar with Haldane's dilemma, but are you familiar with the waiting time problem? Uh, I think so. I'm gonna need a refresher. Well, Haldane's dilemma is a little bit more old school, uh, but it, it talks about you know these mutations we're talking because we can talk about all day like you know duplications are going to build the genome, build the. But it's it's all about these beneficial mutations if they exist. It's all about them going to fixation in, in a population. So there's a paper here called the waiting time problem, and I want to hear. I, I'd like to hear your thoughts about it because um, you seem to know your stuff here and. What it does is it takes into consideration, Taylor, a pre-human population with a population size of approximately 10,000. And what we're looking at is how long is it going to take to take two nucleotides in that genome and then switch them to two other nucleotides at the same location. But if you're waiting for just one single mutation, Taylor, a single nucleotide, say, uh, a single nucleotide change, and you're waiting for the change because this is what it all comes down to that change needs to take hold in the population and become selected to fixation and it's very long to take um that change and make a single specific nucleotide change about yeah, one um, five million years so th there's I a think i'm aware of this uh if i'm not mistaken it was a program written for a creationist that was commissioned for him and he basically does not understand the model. Well, the thing is, uh, if, if you look at the, I would paper, have to look at look it up again, but that's what I remember of it. Well, from from if you look it up in the critiques, it's pretty rock solid. It's been read by over ten thousand scientists with no serious um, critique or, or rebuttal. But if you if you're looking at genetic words, say to get a string of eight nucleotides, the time that it would take would be more time than than the universe is actually. Um, had so what was it called again what's that what was it called again the waiting time problem i i think my whole yeah, i remember is, researching it um i don't remember the exact newer. details it's, but it's, it's a newer i was not convinced it's, the thing is the, what i'm trying to say is there's a multitude of problems so I mean, you can go to the the waiting time problem you can go to haldane's dilemma you know mutation fixation but the thing is it all comes down to net net gain versus net loss, and I haven't really seen any um, solid examples of well, for one, how natural selection is going to um, compensate, and how beneficial mutations are going to compensate for the influx of deleterious mutations. I mean, we're we're clearly going down and not up. And are you familiar with uh, linkage groups? Uh, yeah. So, for example, um, linkage groups, if um, if those blocks of DNA are immune to recombination, for example, um, if, if the best way I can say the good mutations and the bad mutations in, in these linkage groups then cannot be separated because they're immune to recombination. And as we agreed earlier, the bad mutations are overwhelmingly deleterious because the beneficials are, are rare. They outnumber the good mutations. So these linkage groups, aren't they only going to get worse? and not better i mean they're only going to degenerate if it's uh if these bad mutations are linked you can throw in one or two say beneficial mutations but at the end of the day they're just going to be um overcome with bad mutations. it just seems like on all levels of, of our genome it's just nothing but decay and degeneration and that's what i personally would expect um, given a biblical based model, and it seems like the opposite of what you'd expect given a, a model of universal. Oh my God. But everything uh, shuffles around, uh, even the linkage sites are shuffled around. Every single thing inside the cellular mechanism shuffles around, and so you get a diversity of these uh, combinations. And it's, at, it's very, very, very slow. That's why evolution takes place in the millions and billions of years. Uh, so, well, I mean, that's why. So to I'm, go back to what I was starting off with, uh, you shuffle things up and you get this diversity, and and only the ones, the only the best ones, get to go on. So it's actually a self-improving mechanism. 
Right. So I, as I talked about at the beginning, I, I don't disagree with the fact that natural selection is going to amplify the best beneficial mutations, say antibi antibiotic resistance, for example, just to name one, and get rid of the worst detrimental mutations. But it's the low impact near neutral uh, deleterious mutations that natural selection can't do anything about. But I want to say something about well, the recombination real quick, and then you can address that. Um, in those genomic regions that I'm talking about that are linked, the whole point is that there is no um, sexual recombination. So the good and the bad mutations are inseparably linked and they can't be um, teased apart. So those the linkage are, sites change though. They're still linked though. I mean, they can't be. Um, but the sites of those linkages can change. They can. Oh, I agree that they can change, but they're going to change for the worst. Those linkage groups are only going to degenerate. It's, it's a downward spiral and it almost guarantees net genetic degeneration because they are linked, they're not teased apart, and those regions are gonna experience predominantly bad mutations, and they can't be separated from the rare good mutations. So you throw one or two, just for sake of argument in there, they're gonna be neutralized by the large numbers of bad mutations. So that just speeds up the degeneration process. So there's, there's too much degeneration going on to actually build a genome. How do you build a genome based on a net loss of information? As soon as you start affecting the organism's ability to survive and breed, that that gene line dies, so that it's it edits itself out. Um, so, for example, it it minimizes the impact every time. Like for, uh, for turkeys, are a kind of cool example. So only that there will be like a bunch of male turkeys, only the biggest, best, most healthiest of the turkeys will, they'll, all the other males will uh, fight him and whoever's the best, they'll all be his posse and they'll protect his territory for him. Those other, the weaker male turkeys don't get to breed. Only the strongest one does. So right. they're maximizing. So if they have a little bit of deleterious effects, they're still maximizing the one that has the least, even I if it's agree. just these little rust spots. I would say it's constantly selecting out the bad and selecting for the good. I, I would say just so we don't go in circles, I think based on just to sum up everything here, I would say, and, and then I'll, I'll see what you think about that. I think it, it seems like you think as long as beneficials happen, no matter how rare they are, Taylor, you know, this, type of bacteria to biologist evolution must be true because it seems like it, you know as long as you can show me selective adaptations happen which i agree uh but the thing is it, it's hard to grasp how difficult it is to to build a genome uh, apart from from design because um a population taylor it, it can be undergoing genetic kind of like these turkeys okay like natural selection, fine tuning process, you know, these populations can be undergoing genetic decline due to the vast numbers of slightly deleterious mutations that I'm talking about, even while selection may be amplifying a handful of um, these beneficial mutations. And to make it understandable to the audience, to put it in layman's terms, just picture a 10 year old car Taylor, it's degenerating in all possible ways. You can inst install new windshield wipers, uh, change the brakes, switch out the tires, but it's still degenerating in, in all possible ways. There's been an improvement. I agree with that, but um, not the type of improvement that's going to reverse the um, systematic degeneration. So I think it just comes down to net gain versus net loss. And I think the evidence is more so on the side of um, someone who holds to a, a biblical based model. I don't understand how you're going to build a genome based on everything we've, we've been talking about. Go ahead, brother. So, the mutations don't know they're beneficial or deleterious. Like, let's go back to H1N1. Um, you could you could describe their leap to humans as an environment as a beneficial mutation because it allowed them to leap from one uh, one habitat to another. But apparently, that wasn't a good. Well, it is what it is. But once they were in the human systems, they found that they couldn't adapt much. So they, they did change, and they couldn't adapt, and they died. And the, 
what you're describing happens a lot of the time, but then it the, there's some of the cars come out without rust spots and they continue on. Well, I mean the uh, you, you can't see each each rust event, um, but it's still continuous and and destructive. And in in the H1N1 uh, virus that you're talking about, um, from what I'm saying that would explain why the mortality rates went down. Cause we agreed that it did start off as, as a red hot pandemic, went to a whimper, went to an, an extinction event. But what they seen was that the, um, the virus started off more human in its, in its codon usage, and then it ended up randomized. So what it did is it actually became worse at interacting with human DNA over time. And if it's using the wrong codons, Taylor, that means that, um, it's going to be less efficient at replicating in, in human hosts. So that's exactly what's expected under a model of genetic entropy. And, and but they're predicted under a, an assumption of um, a biblical based model. So, I mean, isn't that, isn't that consistent with, with the model that I hold to um, Taylor? Uh, it might be, but uh, to go back to your, like rusty car analogy. Yeah. So if if this car just accumulates rust over time, right? Basically, to keep it analogous to biological evolution, you would have to have a car that was able to uh, adapt and incorporate rust into its system. That's all it does. It just, all right, I'm rusty now, and it works with it. Right. Because yeah, rust, right. rust to the cell or damage, you would say to the cell. It doesn't see as damage. Those are just the new conditions. So it can adapt to that. Rust on a car, you might think is bad, but if the car understands how to use rust, then it's a better car now in every way. Well, I mean, I've seen I've seen 20 year old cars that are that are still driving. You can get them safety, take them to the mechanics, they'll do what they can do. They're all rusted out. But that car is probably not gonna last another three to five years. So sure it's it's um it's it's driving under um the capabilities that it has but like i said just like each rust event is not uh seen the cars exactly. don't replicate so the okay, analogy so only goes so far which is why i need which is why i just described a magical car that could incorporate rust but what cells do is incorporate I what they have and they just make random combinations and random changes and it's it's slow and it's very un, it's 99% unsuccessful but the 1% that does succeed ends up spreading all over the place but the thing is these like even with um, you know genetic drift the, these um, low impact deleterious mutations they're immune to selection and, and that's the I, I think my position is just simply you know these rare beneficial mutations that we're talking about um, they cannot and will not compensate for the relentless influx of deleterious mutations. You're saying that that they will, but you said earlier that you know this process of um, evolution, natural selection acting upon random variation, random mutation, it it happens with lots of time, billions and billions of years. So that's why I say the evolutionists. Um, they don't actually have a science, you know, they hope, they dream, they imagine, but that type of evolution, Taylor, it really only happens in the imagination. It's, it's kind of a faith, in my opinion, it's a faith-based science fiction religion because it goes against everything that we know about empirical science. Cause we just spent almost an hour talking about the degeneration of our genome. And you're saying that a few rare beneficial mutations, which well, I you agree you can't tell me how quickly how much time we have left though so we it's not that does not go against the, the theory of evolution because we can have both we can have both evolving and devolving at the same time we well, can have we can have this long history of change in biodiversity but they're still accruing these miniature uh mutations over time we all might have it uh that's unconfirmed um, as far as uh, explaining, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought on that, but 
Well, are, are, are you familiar with, with the research? I mean, but we might just have to agree to disagree. I think I, I would like to just point out but before we might switch topics slightly, you know, I've pointed out extinction events in, you know, obviously the um, H1N1 human virus, reductive evolution in all types of bacterial populations, extinction events based on increased genetic load in mammoths, uh, populations in Homo uh, Neanderthals, the hobbits. There's evidence that um, uh, what is it? Homo erectus, Homo naledi, when um, experience reductive evolution. We see it in cheetah populations, butterfly populations, and we see it um, in tropic degeneration. A pandemic um, in regards to cancers, autoimmune, immunological, asthma. I mean, we we see it everywhere, and I think it's obvious that. Um, degeneration, the loss of information is not going to take your fish to fishermen and a few rare beneficial mutations is not going to counterbalance the influx of deleterious mutations. So that's my position. Um, if you want to say a, a couple last things, because I think at that point, we're just going to agree to disagree. I, I, I think the evidence is on my side and I think the evolutionists have to do a lot of imagining to, to ignore all that evidence. But um, what do you have to say to that, brother? Well, it's interesting then that most of the scientists would agree with my conclusions, or rather, I would agree with theirs. Um, but so the science is on the side of evolution because you, your main criticism is that we weren't actually there to observe every specific little change, and we're just kind of assuming based on what we, what our model would tell us, and. Uh, that's just it. The model is based on uh, mechanisms that we've proven in the laboratory. All these, all these cellular mechanisms for selection, or, or for um, for how the the genes work and how the genome works, and all the selection pressures uh, in natural selection. We know all these things happen, and we know how they happen exactly down to the molecule. And so when we so we have this uh, theory, and it ha it can explain things that we don't know. And while we didn't observe it, this is precisely how we solve crimes. If we go over, we find a dead body, there's a gun next to it, and uh, there's gunpowder. We never saw anyone get shot, but we saw see a dead guy with a bullet in him. There's gunpowder. We know how guns work. Uh, it ejects the gunpowder and the bullet when it's fired. So it's the same thing with all the science. Um, well, and, and that's why I say, you know, the evolutionists have a nice science fiction, you know, fairy tale on their hands because I would say time is is the um, is is the god of of the evolutionists because. Um, you, you have to dream, you have to hope, you have to imagine that um, the degeneration and decay of, of prior information is actually going to take your, your fish to fishermen. So to, to look at this crime scene you're talking about, if what we know on an observable level is, is that these low impact, near neutral, deleterious mutations are actually um, destroying our information systems, but then you want to look back and conclude that um, you know, your amoeba-like ancestor turned into a whale over billions of years. I mean, that's going to be uh, incorrect. I want to conclude it. It's, it's, but we look at the biodiversity, awesome. and there, this, the what we know of cellular mechanisms explains all of the biodiversity, unlike creation, because there is no explanation for God having created wasps that sometimes eat fruit and some wasps that can only replicate by laying eggs in the brains of beetles. That is fully explainable by random mutations and uh, natural selection. Well, if if we look to... Or why problem, whales have, have hind legs well, inside I mean, those, of them. Well, those why would God legs, give them that? Well, those hind legs, those, those apparent vestigial organs are um, now known to be highly functional and important in um, sexual re reproduction. But uh, I think that that type of evidence is just based on, you know, an ignorance of, of so I'm not saying you're ignorant of science. I'm saying like in the past, what they assumed was, you know, useless, functionless type organs. And now through further scientific investigation. Um, so I think in the past, for example, um, they had over 140 vestigial organs, 
And now, I mean, we can sit here and argue over two or three possibly, but due to scientific advance and even, even ENCODE, I'm curious your, your thoughts on that. You know, they found that at least 80% of the non-coding DNA was transcribed into RNA suggesting function. So the trajectory of discovery that we see now based on the accumulating papers that discuss new functions in these regions um, favors genome-wide functionality. And one other thing I want to say is, you know, we're just beginning, Taylor, to understand the developmental process. Um, you know, how coding and non-coding DNA uh, coordinate when, where, and how, say, structures are sequentially put in place to produce a, a fully functional organism. I mean, in nine months, you know, a, a, a single-celled embryo into a, a, a fully human human being and comprehensive knockout experiments for a mammal, I, I'm sure you're aware of this, have not yet been performed. So that the uh, chances of genome-wide functionality are, are pretty strong. So um, where's the evolutionary leftovers from this process you're, you're talking about? Because I think that goes right into the vestigial organ argument. I mean, um, do you agree that over 80% of our genome is, is functional? Yeah, for... Uh... Most of it is non-coding, but a lot of the non-coding stuff uh, has a regulatory function. Yeah. So, um, so, but you can mess with the regulatory functions a lot uh, and see very few effects. And in fact, that's one of the main differences between apes and humans. So you, I think you just asked about how, what do we see that's conserved between right. them? Uh, we, but we see over fifty percent. We see certain genes only conserved after a certain time period, uh, especially in the fossil record. We can't test fossils for genes, but we know that uh, genes encode for phenotypes. So, and so for the molecular data that we do have, we see uh, genes conserved among what the phylogeny predicted were. Uh, close species, but and we also use the molecular evidence to make the phylogeny more accurate. So here, here here's the problem that I've, I have with these phylogenies and these phylogenetic systematics. Uh, is is that I'm not saying all of it, but a lot of it is based on a primary um, assumption for one that universal common ancestry is true. Um, so any type of evidence. Um, that contradicts it. We'll just come up with a rescue device, a conversion evolution, for example. But it's it's also based on an assumption that most of our nuclear DNA uh, differences or, or evolutionary leftovers or junk or um, you know genomic fossils. But now, so, did, but just do one you, do but you are you aware of the uh, the phylogeny challenge from Aaron Ra? Exactly. And the thing is, so, Aaron Ra assumes that these genetic markers he's using to build the phylogenetic trees are based on evolutionary leftovers. But what I said about junk Well, that DNA, is the best explanation. Yeah, but the thing is, what we know about, about um, the, the fact that, you know, junk DNA has now been overturned and that most of our genomes functional. That was more markers, of like a media label. Scientists said we don't know what it does. But, but but I'm but I'm saying now that because because you just said that this non-coding DNA is heavily involved in regulatory uh, use, right? For the audience sake, that just means when and how fast to say make specific proteins, but also in embryonic development. Um, you know, so that's where that's where protein. most of the mutations would occur, and that's just up and down regulation, and that can easily be uh, regulated by natural selection. Well, are you familiar with, so if we look at like the phylogeny challenge or um, phylogenetic systematics, a lot of it, um, like there are specific genetic markers, ERVs, right, endogenous retroviruses, they'll use these, uh, you, you can say shared mistakes, they'll use these to build the, the phylogenies. But now that most of this um, genome well, is, is now known to perform many valuable functions, that's consistent with, with a common design argument now, because now that's proof that they're not actually um, evolutionary leftovers. Because some of those pseudogenes that, that Aaron Ra uses to build his trees, they're actually now known, and, and you probably agree with this, um, they're necessary and required to sustain healthy life processes in, in the cell. So how do you explain um, all of the incoming data on, on, on um, 
genomic functionality. I mean, that contradicts these phylogenetic um, phylogenetic trees. How do you explain those? So one reason uh, that that fits best is um, the likelihood of these mutations occurring the exact same in two different organisms is astronomically lower than you even right. think that the beneficial mutations are going to be. Right. I agree. Um, and so we see organisms that have these shared uh, heritages and yeah. they're conserved. They're conserved among, you know, maybe a type of fish, but not other fish. So why did some fish get it and some fish don't? Only these fish that all kind of look alike and share a common ancestry have the same thing. See, and uh, so uh, along the lines of like the phylogeny challenge is we would like you to point out at what point the dinosaur is no longer a dinosaur and it's just a bird and with, and, and uh, at what point a limbless lizard is a snake. See, with the what phylogeny, point the, at what no, point I, the I first understand. snakes were snakes? Because with, with the phylogeny challenge, what I'm saying in regards to, because we looked at created kinds. So let me just explain briefly, uh, because what I said is these phylogenetic systematic charts are, are based on the assumption that a lot of this genome is um, functionally useless. So these these shares shared pseudogenes, which were largely assumed to be genetic mistakes. But now we see that a lot of them are being overturned and shown to be functional. That's consistent with our model of what's called um, created heterozygosity hypothesis. And what it is, is if we have heterozygous ancestors, so it's just a fancy word for pre-existing genetic diversity, because we believe God created based on his command to be fruitful and multiply. He didn't want um, Adam and Eve to reproduce by cloning. That wouldn't make any sense. So with these pre-existing DNA differences, an almost limitless variety of combinations of chromosomes, genes and traits are, are then possible. So we look to Taylor recombination gene conversion and what those processes would do would provide many new varieties of combinations of traits quickly since the differences are already built in. So that's how we explain speciation. We expect speciation, we predict speciation, but um, there are limits. Now, he, here's our testable prediction. If God, because a lot of people say, well, that's an ad hoc explanation. Oh, God created Adam and Eve and the created kinds with pre-existing functional DNA differences. Well, here's the thing. That hypothesis makes testable and falsifiable predictions. So we predict that if this is true, the majority of our DNA differences, say nuclear, mitochondrial um, DNA differences will be functional. And now what we know about the genome based on ENCODE, based on the accumulating papers indicating function, this is a confirm confirmation of the model. So now these phylogenetic trees are being torn down because these genetic markers, these pseudogenes, these shared mistakes are now consistent with our model of pre-existing heterozygosity. Does that make sense? A little bit. Um, because they, I don't they, understand why. So you you fully admit that there's microevolution going on. Well, I believe and, I think microevolution is a bad term to use, but I mean, uh, the evolutionists are using it. It's it's common. It's a common term. Use it, but obviously, yeah, because. So you, uh, but you don't even need mutation really for speciation. Um, yes, obviously. It's going to help to have different proteins, but uh, theoretically, w how long would it take for you to call uh, something a different species? How, like, at what point is a limbless lizard a snake? Does it join the snake kind? Like, or, and, and that's, or at what that, point is, if I breed bears into a small little hamster thing, at what point is it no longer a bear? Right, and, and that's a good question. And, and based on what you said proves that you're listening. So that's really good because mutations are only gonna provide a small amount of variety. So you're right. We actually look to uh, the pre-existing built-in genetic diversity, or in other words, pre-existing heterozygosity and recombination and gene conversion, which are not mutation related. So based on this allelic variety, allelic 
potential, visible distinctiveness in offspring is going to be rapid, okay? So we acknowledge that organisms often change over time, right? Microevolution, variations within a kind. But these are limited to the created kind. So I'm getting to your, um, to your answer because speciation, say these similar organisms are isolated um, from one another and these DNA differences accumulate until these populations say they become incapable of inter, interbreeding, for example, speciation has then occurred. So we've, we've made a testable prediction, not only on functional DNA differences, which has been confirmed, but also on um, speciation rates. So there's a new paper out just recently in regards to finches. And there has, has been observed uh, finch populations that in observed time, have gone from uh, shifts in heterozygosity, so heterozygous DNA sites, to homozygous um, DNA sites, which we which we predict, of course, based on pre-existing heterozygosity. And new species, new distinct species of these finches have been observed. So there's uh, a couple papers on that. And that's another confirmation of, of our model. So in regards to your question on creative kinds, we would look to, so we say family level is, um, is so whatever I choose, if I choose the species level, the genus level, it needs, testable predictions need to flow from it. That's the gold standard of the science. So we look to the family level. Now we're gonna look to functionally unique DNA differences across certain families because obviously they don't share ancestry. So that's the only way that we can fully answer the phylogeny challenge. We have some answers. Um, say orphan genes, which are taxonomically restricted. Um, but the more we learn about the DNA language, because we only understand less than 5% of the DNA language, we're, th we're in the infancy of um, understanding the DNA language. So the more we learn about it, the more that our model is confirmed and the more that the evolutionary model is actually being um, falsified for, for many, so, uh, many reasons. Go ahead. So do you accept that birds are dinosaurs? No, I no, I, I wouldn't because, like I said, which what? Tell me which uh, line along uh, dinosaur to bird evolution? Which one was the first bird? See, the thing is, for me to answer that question, I'd have to assume that universal common ancestry is true. But based on everything right. you talked about, it's you not. You just true. have to be able to draw a hard and fast line between them, and you can't because the uh, the gradual change is so slow that no matter which direction you go, you will see gradual change, which you can't draw a hard and fast line on. No, no, because that's the phylogeny we, challenge. But the thing is, the phylogeny challenge is, is fallacious. For one, it, it assumes universal common ancestry is true. So it's kind of more so a challenge for R and Raw. But the thing is, our model, our hypothesis that makes testable predictions created heterozygosity, we're now seeing functionally unique DNA differences separating families. So that's how we can understand. Um, and also based on inbreeding and well, then like, we can understand what's related and, and what's not. And, really, and we can actually conclude that um, the monkey kind or say the ape kind is different than the um, human kind. So, I mean, there's your two distinct created kinds if, if you really want. Um, so what is your criteria for that barrier? The criteria for the barrier when, would be. When is a long necked horse just a giraffe? See, the thing is a lot of what you're saying, say a giraffe and a horse, we have to look at DNA differences um, because obviously, you know this being a cell biologist, these phylogenetic trees and charts, they're built, they're built by sequencing genes, say mitochondrial genes, for example. So like I said, we're looking at, because I'm not sure if you've ever watched the Dr. Herman Mays versus Ken Hoven debate. Herman Mays asked, what type of testable predictions can you make based on neutral variation? And that's because based on the assumption of universal common ancestry, those DNA differences, since they share relationships, they're going to be functionally neutral. But we predict that they're going to be functionally unique because obviously they're not related. So I'm trying to tell you, I might not have every answer to what is a created kind, what is um, shared ancestry, but what we now know about the DNA is slowly confirming that because we're looking to functionally unique DNA differences. You guys are looking to functionally neutral um, DNA differences. But I, I do want to say this: it's it's been it's been exactly an hour. It's actually it's been longer than an hour. I'm I'm gonna let you have the final words here. Sum everything up on on what you think. I think it's been a good discussion, and then. Um, I got something to do. 
I'm going to leave it as, as a free for all if you want, just to kind of talk about random stuff. I think there's a couple of guys in the chat and kind of go from there. So I'll, I'll leave it to you to say whatever you got to say, brother. Go ahead. All right. Um, well, you say that there are, they are distinct, but we can actually make connections between these different kinds. There are transactional forms. Um, and this is just part of the problem is we, we understand that there is no hard and fast line. There is no criteria. There's not a set of DNA that says, well, I'm a different kind now. I don't understand where these barriers are coming from. Uh, and um, so like, when is, when is a long necked horse just a giraffe? Uh, giraffe, uh, speaking of giraffes, uh, I, I think you've probably heard of this example, but the, the vagus nerve, is a pretty convincing evidence that uh, creation science is not consistent with what we see in reality because the, it's a nerve that goes all the way down its neck and back up its neck, which would have no function. Um, it's just that way because it's related to other things that have a, a shorter neck and that's and the, the nerve got tangled up basically. And so it keeps its same position while the neck elongates throughout evolution. And it's, it's just these kind of continuations that have no break between all the kinds. That's very convincing um, on the phylogeny. And uh, I guess I'll just close out by kind of saying uh, you guys admit to all these micro changes, um, but you just kind of assume it seems like this this barrier that somehow knows when the kind needs to stop changing or when to redirect it so that it doesn't become something that's too different. Because let's take language, for example. It changes a, only a slight bit at a time, but you give it enough time and it's gonna look completely different. It's gonna be unintelligible to the people who spoke it just a few hundred years ago. And the same with uh, biological evolution. You add enough changes, it doesn't matter how small they are. It will be different eventually. So that's kind of the position of evolutionists. Well, I, I appreciate your, I'll, I'll just say a couple last words that I appreciate your um, kind of concluding statement there. Um, like I said, and we agreed at the beginning, you know, we don't, disagree with um, natural selection <clears throat> mutations we don't agree we don't disagree that you know um evolution in regards to biological evolution means a change in allele frequency or a change in gene pool in populations over generations it it has to do with the uh, the limits to the change in the direction of the change so it was my um my position that you know neo-darwinism these these mechanisms they lack um, significant creative powers in regards to obviously anatomical novelty, novel information, phenotypic complexity, but it all came down to um, beneficial mutations. It all came down to a net loss versus a net gain. And um, I think it's clear that beneficials cannot keep up with the um, influx of, of deleterious mutations and these near neutrals that uh, Taylor and I talked about. Um, I think it's also quite evident that they are going to be virtually unstoppable. So if natural selection has no way to stop the accumulating damage, nor the ability to um, uh, obviously build a genome based on that, um, I think, like I said many times, that type of evolution the pond scum to people type of evolution that only happens in the imagination of, of those that actually want to um, want to believe in it. And even in regards to the linkage groups that, that we talked about, you know, that seems to be a killer and a destroyer for um, particles to people type evolution because every linkage block is degenerate. So the, the transitional fossils he talks about or an appeal to the fossil record uh, fossils, they're just circumstantial evidence requiring an actual um, mechanism to um, explain that type of large scale evolutionary change. So what we know about observable genomic data, um, we can safely conclude that um, 
that it's false, which means whether it's phylogenetic systematics, any other type of ev evidence, it's, it's being used and it's, it's, it's based on a false assumption that universal common ancestry is true. But since we know it's not true, um, it's more so a, a, a circular argument. So that would be my, um, my conclusion there. And also I want to um, thank Taylor for being respectful. It was fun actually, that hour hour and 10 minutes really flew by. Yeah. Um, I think it would be good for us to even do another one because there's just so much to talk about. I think the gold standard of science is testable prediction. So I think I've provided a couple of hypotheses that make testable predictions. So if that's the gold standard of science, maybe next time we can focus even more on testable prediction. So standing for truth and um, and, and, and Taylor's portion of, of, of the debate is, is over. It's been fun. It's been great. We'll do it again.